1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of them who are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Last week, we looked at these verses, these first verses in 1 Corinthians 15 about the death of Jesus and why did Jesus have to die. And today we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus on this Easter Sunday. And then in the coming two weeks, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll look at the, uh, the, the, our death and then in the final week, our resurrection. And so today I want to focus on the resurrection of Jesus and uh, Welcome today. If you're coming in today because it's Easter Sunday, maybe you're with us as a guest, maybe as a friend uh, of someone in the congregation, uh, in all of our sites, you're very welcome. And Easter Sunday is a very significant day for followers of Jesus. And certain events are significant in our lives. We remember them, such as it could be weddings, births, anniversaries, sometimes even sports, occasions with friends, things we remember. But uh, Easter even can divide opinion as an event. So people can look at Easter as just a holiday weekend. Uh, others might think, well, that, yeah, there's some religious significance to this weekend. And for others, it's kind of the most important weekend of the whole year for them. So maybe you're here today and there's different uh, opinions in the room about how important this weekend is to you personally and Easter Sunday. And I want to try and answer a question today on Easter Sunday, which the question is, why is Jesus unique? Why would I say there's no one else walk the earth like Jesus and there never will again? Why would I say that? And I want to particularly focus on Easter Sunday because I think it holds real keys to the answer to that question of the uniqueness of Jesus. And we go back to these verses I just read to you, verse 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians 15, says, the gospel I preached to you, in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast in accordance with the scriptures. And it's important to say today, whether you're coming in with your questions about Jesus, or you want to know, well, why is he unique? Or you're coming in today as one who is following Jesus and maybe for decades. I, I want to encourage you to say that what Paul's saying here is th this gospel that he's preached uh, he's saying, stand in it, and you are being saved by it if you hold fast. And so my, my encouragement today, I want to encourage you to hold fast to the resurrection of Jesus, to his life, death, and resurrection. I want you to, I want you to stand in the good of the gospel. I want the resurrection to do good to you today, to strengthen you as we look at these things again. And Easter can seem strange. Is, it, is this penniless? homeless preacher who died on the cross and rose again three days later. It's a strange story. And so why is Easter Sunday so important to the uniqueness of Jesus? Because there are some things about Jesus which you would think, well, uh, uh, you would say, well, it, that doesn't make him unique. So many would say, many historians would say, oh yeah, he existed. Um, there's enough evidence from secular historians at the time that talk about this Jesus, that he probably existed. He, he was born, he did live, he did work, and he died. But as you, you don't need me to tell you, that doesn't make him unique. Uh, again, many people would think he was maybe a good moral teacher. He said some good things, helpful things, ways to live. But that doesn't make him unique because thousands have done that through the ages and said this is a way to live. It doesn't make them unique. It doesn't make Jesus unique. Uh, some would think he was a prophet. Maybe that's you. Maybe you think, well, he is. Jesus is a prophet. And uh, I just want to say it doesn't make him unique. Um, secular historians at the time 
would say there were around 18 others, even around the time of Jesus, who was recorded were going around saying they were prophets. So that doesn't make Jesus unique. It's even in Scripture. We find it in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, verse 36, it talks about someone called Theodos who thought he was a prophet. And then in the next verse, Acts 5, 37, it talks about Judas the Galilean, and he led a revolt, and 2,000 of his followers were killed. And this was happening when Jesus was a boy. So there are, there are others around who think they're prophets, who think they're going to do amazing things because they've got something to bring. They just, they just get killed and life moves on. So if Jesus was a prophet, he wasn't just a prophet. That doesn't make him unique. So maybe he was just a, someone who went around doing good deeds, kind things. But that definitely doesn't make him unique. But here's the thing. Jesus said he could forgive sins. Jesus said he knew God in heaven, Yahweh, as his father. That was outrageous. The religious leaders, they were furious when he said these things. They picked stones up to throw at him. Jesus didn't just say he was a prophet. He didn't just say, here's some nice things. He said, no, I can forgive sins. And this is my father, the God of the Bible. He's my father in heaven. Jesus didn't just say nice things. You see, I want to say, I believe he was a great teacher. He was a great worker of miracles. But there must be something more about Jesus that two billion people plus today are worshipping him and following him. That's, why would he be unique? What, what, am I, what am I getting at? Why does he stand alone in history? Let's go on and come back to our passage. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with with the scriptures, we looked at that last week, verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. See, it's the events of Easter that I want to say make Jesus unique. He died on a cross. This is Good Friday. This is what happened. We looked at it last week. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He spent Easter Saturday in a tomb with a stone rolled over it, buried. His disciples, distressed, distraught, thinking the end had come. This was the one who was going to save us. This was the Messiah. He was going to throw off the Romans. Easter Saturday, he's buried in a tomb. And they, don't, they haven't understood what's happening. It can seem like our lives, even those of us who follow Jesus, can feel like it's a season where we're in Easter Saturday. It's like, Jesus, where have you gone? What's happened? I want to say, just as Easter, just as Easter Saturday is only a day, times in your life, seasons where you think, where's God? Is he gone? It's only ever a season because Easter Sunday comes. We look at this. That he was raised on the third day. That's what Paul says. He's rose from the dead. This is what makes Jesus unique. It's the events of Easter Sunday that are so important. No one else is risen from the dead. It's not what it, it's, 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 when you go back 2,000 years, there weren't people being raised from the dead. It's not like, well, yeah, that was okay back then. No, 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 no. How could, it wasn't happening. No one expected this to happen. It was like, what is going on here? And the Bible says mighty power that God exerted raised Jesus from the dead. Mighty power. Something's happening. In the resurrection, it says that the, the curtain of the temple, which separates us from a holy God, gets torn in two because of the mighty spiritual power that's being exerted. The rocks are splitting. The sun is hiding. He says, people are starting to come out of tombs in Jerusalem because of spiritual power that's raised Jesus from the dead. This, this Jesus is resurrected. He has power over life and death. This is my question. You see, will we 
Will we live, are we living, in the good of the indestructible power of Christ? So we gather on Easter Sunday, my friends, this is the best news. Jesus is risen from the dead and he's alive forevermore. Death couldn't hold him. This is central to the Christian faith. It's very important. You say, well, why is it a big deal? Paul says further in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, he says in verse 13 and 14, he addresses it because the, there were things happening in the church in Corinth that were saying, oh, I'm not sure Jesus was resurrected from the dead. I don't think we have to believe that. Paul says this in verse 13 and 14, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching, or he's saying, my preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. Doesn't mean anything if Christ hasn't been resurrected from the dead. If it's not true, then we might as well go home. That's what he's saying. It's absolutely crucial. You see, Jesus isn't just a good teacher. He's not someone who just brings some nice ideas. He's not just a revolutionary who turns some things upside down. He's the son of God. And death couldn't hold him. Death couldn't hold him. This is what Peter says in Acts chapter 2. We looked at this a number of weeks ago. He says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and for knowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, but God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It wasn't possible. You think, well, how could it be? He can't be, can it? Because Jesus is the author of life. How can the author of life be held by death? He submitted himself to death. He went to the cross willingly. He laid down his life. He gave it up. It wasn't taken from him. He gave it up. He offered his life up. But he has power to take it back up again. And his father exerts mighty power from heaven. So what happens, it was prophesied over Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 25, he talks about this one coming. And he says, on this mountain, it's like he said, it's like this, it's like this covering that's over peoples. It's like there's something covering people. There's a garment over people. And one's coming and he will swallow up death forever. And this like garment, this thing that's over people, over nations, is going to get swallowed up by life. And this is what happens at the resurrection. And we gather today to worship Jesus because he is risen from the dead and he's alive forevermore. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father in majesty and glory. Hallelujah. He's alive forevermore. He's conquered death. And we now get to live in his life. The old has gone. The new has come. He is now our peace, our hope, our joy, our future, our life. This is for us because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is good news. This is the best news. But let me say this as well, because we live in a very skeptical age. We live in an age, people don't believe, do they, in resurrection from the dead any more now than they did 2,000 years ago. And it's like, oh, let's just have Christianity uh, without this, okay? But we can't. You see, John Stott make, in his commentary on uh, 1 Corinthians, he says this about the resurrection. He says, Christianity is concerned not with mere immortality, uh, nor with, it's not just about Christianity, it's not just about sheer survival or getting by, nor with reincarnation. No, Christianity is about resurrection from the dead. For Paul, as with all New Testament writers, this necessarily meant the raising for the, of the whole person from the dead, not just his soul or his body or even his personality. Resurrection is consistently seen in the New Testament as a demonstration of God's power over death. Almost invariably, it is God who raises Jesus from death. Jesus does not rise of his own accord. If God raised Jesus from the dead, he will also raise all those who are in Jesus. We'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. This resurrection is central. But today it's like, why you can you don't really believe in that, do you? Dead people don't come back to life. 
How can we be sure of the resurrection? I want to say today, maybe you've got questions. Maybe that's one of your questions. You're asking questions about Jesus. Maybe you're here today as someone who's followed Jesus for decades. I just want to remind you, I, I talk often about a reasonable faith. To follow Jesus, you do need faith. It is an act of faith. It's a, it's a trust. It's a belief in Jesus, who he said he was and who he is and your own condition. And now G only Jesus can bridge the gap between you and a uh, holy God. But it's not unreasonable. Why do I say that? What about evidence for the resurrection? Let me just say three things, maybe. We'll come back to the passage. That's probably why I'm majoring on it, because in this passage, this is what Paul goes on to talk about. Eyewitnesses. How can I be sure? You might be, well, how can I be sure of the resurrection on this Easter Sunday? Well, let me help you. Eyewitnesses. So let's look at this. You see, Paul wrote a letter uh, 22 years after the events he's talking about here. Around 22 years, in the, late, uh, in the late 50s of the first century, he writes this letter to the church in Corinth. It's what we've read today. Verse 5, he's saying, well, Jesus, this Jesus is, is risen from the dead. Verse 5, oh, and, and then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the 12. And he means the disciples who are now the apostles. He appeared to them. Okay, verse 6, as if that's not enough. Oh, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. So this is after Jesus is raised from the dead and before he ascends to heaven, which we looked at just at the turn of the year in Acts chapter 1. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Although some have fallen asleep, some have died, some have passed away, but most, most of the 500 are still alive. What's Paul doing here? Why is he talking like this? You see, what he's saying is, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appeared to five, this is only tw 22 years later. He, he's appeared to 500 and most of them are still alive as they would be 22 years later. Most of them are still here. What he's saying is, if you don't believe me, you can go and speak to them and go and have a chat with them. Did you see Jesus or not? This guy, I mean, this guy Paul saying that Jesus appeared to you, did he? Paul said, we'll go and check it out. And you think, well, hang on. Yeah, that's reasonable. So I thought back 22 years in my life. What happened 20? Can I, can I remember anything from 22 years ago in my life? And I can, actually. There's some very significant things happened in my life 22 years ago. I think if you'd seen the risen Jesus, that would be significant in your life. I can remember significant things. There's, I can't remember lots of things from 2002. But I can remember a number of things, significant things that happened very clearly. This isn't unreasonable. This is what this passage is saying. He's not, he's not just saying, Jesus is raised from the dead and you better believe it. Not saying that in this passage. It's it appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, then to more than 500. And most of them are alive. Go to Jerusalem if you don't believe me. Go and check it out. That's what he's saying. You can find witnesses to this thing. It's reasonable. Then he says in verse 7, and then he appeared to James and all the apostles, and then to me. I'm, I'm sure he's referring to his encounter with Jesus, knocks him to the ground on the road to Damascus, remarkable conversion. It's appeared to me. It's appeared to me. Jesus. It's so real. There's eyewitnesses. This isn't just someone saying, believe it, believe it, believe it, trust, believe, believe. He said, no, go and check it out. That's what this letter's saying, in effect, to the people that are receiving this. Believe me, go and check it out. People saw him, hundreds. Second reason, that's one, eyewitnesses. How can, we be how can I be sure? I get this resurrection's important, but we live in such a sceptical world, don't we? What about the empty tomb? So I was, how, did the t how, how was the tomb empty? And again, there's some theories. So, so one would be uh, Jesus was not really dead. He was, con he was kind of unconscious on the cross. And they took him down. They put him in the tomb unconscious rather than actually dead. That, that is a real theory that's around. It has major problems. Uh, uh, like there the were Roman soldiers who horribly did this probably most days, certainly most weeks. They were expert expert at crucifying people, an expert at knowing whether people were dead or not. 
they, they wouldn't have, they, they don't make mistakes on this sort of thing. And then Jesus had to get himself out of the tomb. So he had to move a one ton stone after being on the cross for hours and being stabbed in the side and massively weakened. How's he do that? And thirdly, even if he did, so even if the Roman soldiers got it terribly wrong, and even if he's got the energy to move a one ton stone, he then reveals himself and then disappears and he's never seen again. Really? So weird. I can't, I can't believe that. That doesn't make any sense. Another theory as to why the tomb's empty. The authorities stole and hid the body. Okay, yeah, yeah, maybe. But we, just think about it. Why would they do that? And here's the thing. Secondly, if they did that, why didn't they just produce the body? So this thing's starting to grow. Peter's starting to preach. The thousands are starting to follow Jesus. If they've got the body, they're going to bring the body of Jesus out and say, you lot are making this up. Here he is. He's dead. Which they would have done. Of course they didn't steal the body out of the tomb. doesn't make any sense anymore that Jesus was just unconscious and not dead and got himself out. doesn't make any sense. Third theory is, hey, the disciples stole and hid the body. Now we get, oh, yeah, okay, that makes more sense. Does it? Does it? How did they get past the guarded tomb? No one ever admitted it. This is the thing. Nothing is ever written down by anyone saying, ha, we made it up. <laughs> we got him out. We, we, we got it out and, and hid the body and then pretended he was alive. No one's ever said that, ever. No, that word never got around. That's what happened. Never a glimmer of it. Seems very unlikely to me. And here's the thing. These disciples, these followers of Jesus, are utterly, radically changed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are they really going to be so changed by something they know didn't happen because they tricked everyone, that they're then going to die for it. I don't think so. Peter denied Jesus three times when he's arrested, gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is resur re resurrected, filled with the Holy Spirit. He's preaching to thousands. They're laying hands on the sick and seeing them raised up for a lie, for something they know isn't true. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. There's others. They're killed for their faith. The Apostle Paul's life radically transformed. Why worship, follow, die for a person you know is dead and you're living on a lie? It makes no sense. Any of these, any of these theories as to why the tomb emptied make no sense. The one that makes the most sense to me is that God raised Jesus from the dead by mighty power that he exerted, that he broke in on space and time that he came in with a supernatural act of power and raised Jesus from the dead. That's actually, when you start to look at this, it makes the most sense. I would say this, look, I'll, I'll finish with this. How can we be sure? Look, historical evidence. There's, this book's been around a while, but it's, it, it's not easy to beat. The man called Lee Strobel, who wrote something book, The Case for Christ. Uh, I'll read a short extract from the book. It says this, this... He says this, it was the worst news I could get as an atheist. My agnostic wife had decided to become a Christian. Over the following months, I was intrigued by the positive changes in her character and values. Finally, I decided to take my journalism and legal training. I was the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune and systematically investigate whether there was any credibility to Christianity. Maybe I figured I could extricate her from this cult. I quickly determined that the alleged resurrection of Jesus was the key. Anyone can claim to be divine, but if Jesus backed up his claim by returning from the dead, then that was good evidence he was telling the truth. For nearly two years, I explored the minutiae of the historical data on whether Easter was myth or reality. I didn't merely accept the New Testament of face value. I was determined only to consider facts that were well supported historically. As my investigation unfolded, my atheism 
began to buckle. What he's saying is, as I actually looked at the evidence, my atheism began to buckle. One by one, my objections evaporated. I read books by skeptics, but one by one, their counter-arguments crumbled under the weight of historical data. And in the end, after I had thoroughly investigated the matter, I reached an unexpected conclusion. It would actually take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a follower of Jesus. That is why I'm now celebrating my 30th Easter as a Christian, not because of wishful thinking, the fear of death, or the need for a psychological crutch, but because of the facts. That's what he says. My friends, what's our response today to the resurrection of Jesus? You're in the room. What do you think about Jesus? Maybe you're asking questions. Do you believe he is unique? It's my question at the start. Well, I've said today, if this happened, he is unique. But spiritual revelation, even though this is reasonable, I've gone through actually this. The, res, the, empty, the reason for the empty tomb is the resurrection of Jesus makes by far the most sense. It still needs spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to come and reveal these things to you. You, you, you have understanding. That's what happened to me one day. I suddenly understood who Jesus was. I understood my need for a savior because of sin that was in my life. The things, the failure that separates me from a holy God could only be bridged. The gap could only be met by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as he took my sins on the cross on himself. And then as I accept him as my savior, his resurrection power comes into my life and I get to spend an eternity with God. That's what happens, but you need spiritual revelation. See, Jesus is really risen. And we'd have confidence in the resurrection in your daily life. This really happened in time and space. God, the eternal God, is breaking in on space and time in this moment. That's what he's doing 2,000 years ago on a hillside in Jerusalem. Over life and death. This couldn't hold the author of life. It really happened. It really is risen from the dead. It's my testimony. I believe it utterly. It's the very best news. I want you to live your life in the power of the resurrection. See, there's a man called um, uh, John uh, Batterson, who, um, Mark Batterson, who um, wrote The Circle Maker, a famous book about prayer. He also wrote another book uh, called The Grave Robber about Jesus and how he defeats death. And what he talks about in there, he, he says at one point, and it's really struck me over time as I read this book, he said, as Christians, we, we need to try and find a way to live as though Jesus was crucified yesterday he rose from the dead today and he's coming back tomorrow. So if you like, we keep that sense of wonder at our conversion that Jesus died for our sins. It's like it happened yesterday. It's like today I'm living in the good of his resurrection power. And it's like, oh, I can't wait for his return. We live like that. It'll change us. You're living the good of the resurrected Christ every day will be different, the things that challenge us, the things we think we can't get round, the obstacles, the confusion, the mystery. No, no, I'm living in the good of the indestructible power of the resurrected Lord Jesus. Let's do that today on this Easter Sunday.